thank you for your anointing and for your spirit in our midst today. Thank you for the searching of the scriptures. Thank you for the light that will flood our hearts as a result of your holy word. We have gathered today as disciples of Yeshua, the Messiah. We ask in that revelation will fill our hearts. We we'll pray for a hearing ear and a seeing eyes. We we'll pray for comprehension and understanding. We we'll pray that our hearts will not be distracted, our mind will not be far off. We we'll pray that we will be alert to the Spirit. In the areas of our life where we need to make restitution, correction, adjustment, repentance, we're praying this season, Jehovah, you will begin to reveal to us. As you reveal to us, help us be convicted. And as we are convicted, we are changed. We're changed daily becoming like the Messiah in all we do, in all we think. We're praying for the equipping of the Spirit, the boldness, the strength, the empowerment that we will become men and women who lead heavenward. We come against the deception of evil desires, sinful desires. We come against the, dest the destructions, deceptions, delusions. We come against the mental drain of our energy, unnecessary activities that drain us of our divine energy. We pray for focus and discernment that we will do the work you've placed in our hands to do well enough, being mindful of the time we have. Help us not be distracted. Help us keep focus. Focus, Father. We thank you today. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Today is a very, very, very special day. A very, very special day. And like I said to us, we've been searching our hearts on the need for repentance. You know, in a, this issue of repentance. Repentance is key in this hour. The repentance which is an about face tone that will cause you and I to begin to reflect the Messiah. You see, our lives are transformed when we taste and experience true repentance. True repentance. And I hope that today's teaching will achieve its purpose in our life today. For those who are with us on Facebook, Saint, welcome to House of Israel, Lagos, Nigeria. I'm so excited to be here with you. And we are so immensely full of joy to be here with you also we are broadcasting right from Lagos, Nigeria. This is House of Israel, Lagos, Nigeria. This is House of Israel, Lagos, Nigeria. At House of Israel, our vision is to be a worshipping people. At House of Israel, our vision is to be a worshipping people. At House of Israel, our vision is to be an evangelistic community. A people known for winning souls. Are people known for reaching out? Are people known for spreading the good news of the kingdom? An evangelistic community at House of Israel our Vision is to be a discipleship center. At House of Israel our Vision is to be an equipping network. At House of Israel our Vision is to be a worldwide witness for Yeshua the Messiah. This five foot core vision encapsulates the whole ideal for which Messiah Yeshua sent us out. And my prayer is that we will be faithful to this vision. 
we will be deeply faithful to this vision and live out this vision daily 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 that this vision this vision becomes an outflow of your life I wish you wake up every day, you wake up in the morning having this vision at the back of your mind. This is where I live this morning. As you step out of your bed, the five-foot vision of House of Israel should guide your activity. It should guide our actions. I am a worshiping person. I am a discipleship center. I am a discipleship center. I am an evangelistic community. I'm an equipping network. I am a worldwide witness for Yeshua the Messiah. That should be the core, the core of how I see life, how we think, how we move as a ministry. Our investment, our time should be to outpour ourselves in this five foot core vision. The time is short. The time is short. Let's not live a wasted life. Let's not live a life that is wasted. Let's amass ourselves in this five foot vision of House of Israel, Lagos. Our core mandate as a ministry is to take the true gospel of the kingdom of Jehovah to the ends of the earth. To take the true gospel of the kingdom. To take the true gospel. To take it. Nobody's going to do it for us. We are going to do it ourselves. We are going to be the one responsible in Africa, in Lagos, in Nigeria, all apart the world. We are to be responsible to take the true gospel of the kingdom of Jehovah to the ends of the world. May we become responsible in all we do to catalyze our spiritual awakening and to take the true gospel to the ends of the world. In our discipleship classes, we've looked at various things and subjects and matters as relate to being an effective disciple of Messiah Yeshua. We've looked at various models. And we know that the, 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 the model of Messiah is the exact model we as a ministry should, should learn from. Living our lives as a disciple is to become like the master. Day to day, your actions, your attitude, your behavior, your emotion, everything should be for us to be like the, ma the master. That's the dream of a true disciple. The dream of a true disciple is to be like his master. No more, no less. That should be our life ambition. As disciples of Messiah Yeshua. Today, I want us to look at something so integral in the times we live right now. We live in a time when Paul called the perilous time. The perilous time. We live in the perilous times. We live in dangerous times. We live in very sensitive time. We live in a time the Bible called a wicked age. We as believers in Messiah and the people of the kingdom should understand how should we live our life, how should we carry ourselves, bearing in mind the times we live. What should be our vision? What should be our ambition? What should be our calling? How should we carry and portray ourselves? Bearing in mind we live in a perilous time. So quickly, let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. We will be examining the fate of the immigrant. The fate of the immigrant. We are looking at the fate of the immigrant. The goal of today's teaching and class is to help us come to the place of repentance. We must change the way we live our lives because if you will understand this message, this message calls you and I to repentance. It calls also a change of lifestyle. It calls for a change of behavior. It calls for the change of allegiance. There has to be a change of allegiance, a change of behavior. We are examining today the, the immigrant fate or the fate of the immigrants. We will be examining the journey of Abraham, looking at, it, at Abraham's journey at, as it is revealed to us in Hebrews 11. Now let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews 11 verse 8. Hebrews 11 8. Amazing. Hebrews 11 8. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as an inheritance. 
obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going, Jehovah called Abraham into the faith of the immigrant. Abraham was called out of his father's house from his country to a place where Jehovah will show him. We see Abraham here embracing the immigrant lifestyle. We see Abraham embracing migration. A migration not knowing where he was going. Abraham was called to a place he would later receive as an inheritance. He obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. The writer of Hebrews tells us specifically that Abraham obeyed, not knowing where he was going. To embrace the journey of migration, not knowing where you are going, it's a big size faith. It's a big size realization. It's a big size awareness. So first we see here that Abraham, Abraham embraced migration not knowing his destination. Abraham embraced migration not knowing his destination. Verse 9. By faith he made his home. In a promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country, he embraced migration to such a point in his life where he made his home in a promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. Important. In embracing migration and not knowing his destination, Abraham will embrace the lifestyle of a stranger in a foreign country. That means to him, Abraham will live in tents because tents to him was the awareness of himself being a stranger. The tent concept for Abraham was a full sense of awareness daily. I'm not from here. Abraham had, Abraham had the resources. He had the money. He had the resources he needed to build himself an empire. He could build for himself a gigantic skyscraper, a mansion, but Abraham made a decision to live in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the promise. The tent was a reminder that there were men called to migration. The tent was a reminder that they were not from here. The tent was a message for this man. As we see their life, we will Examine our own life. Are we living? Are we living a tent life? Are we living a life of tent living, or have we made an empire for ourselves in this world? As Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise, verse ten. For he was looking forward to the city with foundation. Hebrews eleven ten. For he was looking forward to the city with foundation, whose architect and builder is Elohim. Verse 11. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made a promise. Verse 12. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendant as numerous as a star in the sky, and as countless as the sun on the seashore. Verse 13. All these people, all these people, were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a, a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Verse 14. People who say such things, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Verse 15. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Verse 16. Instead, 
They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, Elohim is not ashamed to be called their Elohim. For he has prepared a place for them. For he has prepared a place for them. Looking at this passage, passage of scriptures, we are going to extract a very core important message that will help us as believers in Messiah embrace a new lifestyle, embrace a new vision, embrace, embrace a new way of thinking and seeing our lives. Migration is the movement of a population within or between countries. Migration, migration is the movement of population within or between countries. When people make a decision to migrate, it is often to seek settlement or resettlement. When you see a man who makes a decision to migrate, it's often to seek settlement or resettlement. Abraham's decision to migrate was not to seek an earthly settlement or an earthly resettlement. Abraham had in his mind the vision of what he would tell for the vision of the homeland. He had a homeland vision. Now let's look at Hebrews 11 verse 14 again. Hebrews 11 14. So key. So crucial. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Hebrews 11 14. Profound. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. The homeland vision. I think one of the things we've missed as believers is that we have lost the understanding of the difference between the homeland and the host country. As believers, we are called to live with this understanding of our homeland while understanding the host country. Abraham knew so well as we must also know today where our home country is, where is your homeland? When I see believers, the way we live our lives so attached to material things, the way we live our lives so connected with this world system, the way we live our lives, the way we respond to issues of the world, as we see racism, we see murder, we see injustice, we see poverty, we see corruption, how should the believer respond to these things? How should we as believers respond to racism? How should we respond to injustice? How do we respond to corruption? It's certain we must understand that we cannot change the order of things in this world. We can lend our voice to them. We can lend our voice, our insight to, this, to these things. But we must understand that we must be men who speak from our homeland. You must speak from your homeland. We must not allow the host country, the world, define our reaction because you can become so rea you can become so re reactionary as you look at the abomination people practice, the lawlessness, the lawlessness we see in our world can grieve our heart so much. You become you begin to grieve in your heart the same way Lord grieved over Sodom. Many times I grieve at the things I see. The lawlessness. This man, this patriarch of old, saw the same lawlessness, but you know something about them. They were longing for a better country. The believer lives, the believer lives with the understanding of the homeland. And what the host country. 
Now look at these two concepts. The homeland, the homeland concept. The homeland concept. In Hebrews 11 verse 14, it says, People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own, their homeland. Verse 15 says, If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. When Abraham left his, his country, his kinsmen, his family, he was in search for his homeland. If Abraham had had a sense of his, in his being of, oh, I'm attached to my father's house, I'm from there, he may return back there when things get rough. The reason why many believers keep returning back to the world, they keep backsliding backward, is because they don't understand the difference between the host country and the homeland. Paul tells us in Romans 12, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12 verse 2. Be not conformed to this world. Meaning, this world is not our homeland. Yeshua tells us, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We have become so overprotective of retaining ownership of a host country, not our place. He says, you are in the world, but not of the world. Yeshua tells us, you are in the world, but not of the world. You are in your host country, but not, it is not your homeland. <laughs> you can live in a host country, not your homeland. The immigrant faiths. As we see in the life of this patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and men who lived after them, these men had a pit, they had the, the, the immigrant faith. They lived in such a way they admitted that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. You know, you know I, I was thinking about this idea. Regaining the understanding that you and I are foreigners and strangers on earth. Understanding once again I'm a stranger on earth. This is not our home. Hallelujah. In verse 16, see what it says in verse 16. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. We're going to look at two things, two things that, the, that, that defines this heavenly country. These two things, two things that defines and shape the heavenly country. Number one, the heavenly country is designed by God. And the heavenly country is built by God. That's what it says to us here. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their Elohim. For he has prepared a city for them. Oh, hallelujah. Now look at something, some, something so paramount here. Something we must not be quick to miss. Look at verse, verse 10, Hebrews 11, 10. Hebrews 11, 10. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations. 
for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect mark the word architect and builder is Elohim an architect is a designer a, a constructor of of a building he is the mastermind of a building he draws out a plan He draws out the model. He prepares the model. Abraham and the patriarch showed us what they were looking out for was what? A city with foundations. A city whose architect, a city whose builder is God. Our world, our life can become stronger, deeper when we regain the patriarch vision of the homeland concept of living our life daily, seeking the city whose architect and builder is Elohim. If you live as if this world, this earth, this world is your homeland. Your faith will be inoperative. Many of us need to repent and ask God to have mercy upon us because we are living to build for ourselves an empire in this host country. Our faith has been so watered down. Because we've lost the vision of eternity. We will stop looking forward to the city with foundations. A true disciple of Messiah has to understand that the road is rough. The road is narrow. We must daily cease. To allow the sinful pleasures of this world control our emotion, our will, and our desires. The need to grow in an increased awareness that we are seeking and we are looking forward to the city with foundations. The city whose architect and builder is God. So we see two things about the city. Is a first, God is a designer of the city, and then God Himself is the builder of it. Society may not want the mention of God, no mention of God in our schools, no mention of God in politics, no mention of God in business, no much mention of God in morality, no mention of God in social affairs. But see, every society that, that eludes or avoids the mention of the name of God will crumble because what? The systems of this world is going to crumble. Wise men seek and surrender to the city of God. They are men whose heart is whose heart yearns. Whose heart yearns and desire the city that God is building. The world system is currently being built on lawlessness. The world system is currently being built on wickedness. On corruption. Nations built on corruption. Like the wickedness of Sodom, we see lesbianism, homosexuality, gay rights, abortion. We see legislators who should be the light of society as regards to the passing of, of, of bills and laws. We see they are the ones who are involved in passing immoral laws. Legislating for wickedness. We see our politicians, our lawmakers, busy passing laws 
that will advance their greed, passing law that will advance their selfishness, passing law that will advance their own benefit. The wickedness of this world is growing the same way the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah grew. It's appalling that men are not seeking God. It's time we regain like Joseph did in Egypt and Daniel in Babylon. Daniel knew that he was not of Babylon. These men did not allow the Babylonian system to shape their lives. These men were in Babylon, but yet they lived as strangers. They lived as foreigners in Babylon. The reason why we cannot shape this world is because we are living as if this world is our homeland. How was Joseph able to shape Egypt? Joseph knew he was in Egypt, but he knew he was not of, he was not of the Egyptian. Why? He told them, make sure my bones, make sure I'm not buried in Egypt. Joseph told them, make sure when you are leaving Egypt, take my bones with you. Take my bones out of Egypt. It is not my homeland. Amazing. That when they left Egypt, they took Joseph's bones along. The patriarch had a homeland concept right from the beginning, right from the outset. Right from the outset, they knew they thought that way. We are supposed to civilize a generation, not allow our mind become conformed to this world. I'm telling you, the reason why our faith is not working, our faith is weak. Many times, God, the world is shaping our faith. The things we see now direct our emotion. The things we see affect our will. We are no longer seen from above. We are no longer seen and trusting from the homeland. We are too fearful that things will be deprived of us right in the host country. We allow the host country to decide our voice. When it's time for all to speak to politics, to speak into government, we must speak not with timid voice or with voice of fear, as if we have anything to lose. Saint, we have nothing to lose here. We have nothing to lose here. We have nothing to lose here. And we have nothing to gain here. We've got nothing to lose and we've got nothing to gain. The patriarch had this idea right, right from the onset. Now let's look again at Hebrews 11.8. And let me set the layers for this teaching. Hebrews 11.8. By faith, Abraham went called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. So he, 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 Abraham embraced the migration faith. The migration faith, the faith to move, not knowing where you're going. The faith to move, not knowing where he was going. Verse 9, by faith he made his home in a promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. If we begin to live our life today on earth like strangers in a, in a foreign country, our life will become better. We become conscious of our time, of our moment, of our days. We will live more inspiring life. Our life will become so inspiring. We won't live to grab. We will live to contribute. We won't live to be absorbed in the system. We will live to make a difference. The reason why we as believers are not making a difference is because you and I have become so immersed in the system. In the system. What the patriarch of all did was this. They freed their heart from being absorbed in a system, being absorbed in a world as their home country, as their home land. They lived as foreigners. They live their life like strangers. They live like strangers in a foreign country. 
If you begin to reorder the way you live your life now, I will begin to live like strangers in a foreign country. Will we begin to see spots and areas where God wants us to function? Each of us will begin to find our calling and our place, our vocation. We will find our giftings. The moment we gain the understanding that we are called to live like strangers in a foreign country. You will know your time is short. You will, make, you, you will always live with a sense of numbering your days. Like the psalmist says, it teach us to number our days. That we may, have, we may apply our heart to wisdom. We, we learn how to number our days. When we live like strangers in a foreign country. But when you live as if this is your homeland, you forget the times of God. You forget the plans of God. You forget that time. The time here is short. You forget home. Many of us have forgotten home. All you're dreaming and thinking about is how your life here will be convenient. You're dreaming so much of your convenience. You have your life worked out. How you'll be so convenient here. Whatever goes against your convenience becomes your irritation. You are irritated when things do not bring, do not go in line with your convenience. We seek convenience, satisfaction. But this world does not offer us convenience. This world does not offer to us our satisfaction. It's not from here, saints. So we see that by faith, Abraham made his home. In the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents. He lived in tents as Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Pastor, for, for, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. The city with foundations can only be built, designed and built by God. When we speak about the kingdom of God, we are speaking about something so profound and deep that without the kingdom of God, mankind cannot stand. Without the kingdom of God, your life is worthless and meaningless. When you keep avoiding the mention of God, when we keep undermining the place of God, we are walking the path of the fool. Abraham and the patriarch were looking forward to the city with foundations. This world has no foundation. You can't build everlasting, you can't have your treasure laid up on this, head, on this earth. It will erode with time. Those who understand the seeking of a city with foundation are being to place their heart on the eternal things, the things that have eternal value. Invest your life in that which has eternal worth. Whatever you build upon a city with that foundation will crumble. You're living your life daily, day in, day out. And you're walking on a city without foundation. All political system has no foundation. The bank economic system has no foundation. All human cultural religious systems have no foundation. Abraham turned their back against the systems of men. They were seeking for a city with foundation that only God can build and design a city that has foundation. Only God can build and design a city that has foundation. What does this say to us saints? There is nothing earth can give to me. There is nothing on earth I desire. 
if I have ever desired anything this world has to offer, I today denounce. I refuse to live with a grabbing mentality. Grab to build on this edge that has no foundation. I'm telling you. Many labor, labor in greed and selfishness to build upon a city that has no foundation. Many people live a life that has no foundation. The life that has foundation is a life that God is both the architect and its builder. And its builder. Now let's turn, let's fast forward. Let's just go, go, go forward a bit. Let's fast forward to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 verse 24. Hebrews 11 24. Hebrews 11 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of Elohim rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. 26. He regarded disgrace for the he regarded disgrace for the sake of Messiah as of greater value. Than the treasures of Egypt. This is strange to this is strange to this generation. A generation in search of fame. A self-centered generation cannot understand what Moses did. Moses denounced the riches and the pleasures of Egypt and chose to suffer affliction with the people of Messiah. Think about these things. I'm telling you, the way we live our life has to change. It has to change. Moses could have lived an easy life. Moses could have lived a more convenient life. Easy and convenient is often the path away from God. Many times when the way is easy and convenient, it does not lead to God. The city without foundation. The Bible says the road is wide. Broad is the road. Wide is the gate. And there are many who walk therein. There are many walking on the road to the city without foundation. Only few men, only few men walk in the narrow road. The narrow road that leads all to the city with foundation. And Abraham Isaac and Jacob had to make a decision to walk in a path that will lead them to the city with foundation. Now look at Moses once again. Moses, Hebrews 11, verse 26. Or let me read from verse 25 to give more context. Hebrews 11, 25. Moses chose to be mistreated. Oh. Can you see this? Can you, can, you, can, you, can you look at this deeply? Hebrews 11 25. Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. He chose the unjust treatment. He chose what many we call a lesser life. He chose a more humble circumstance. He chose to be mistreated. And he chose it. It was a decision Moses made when he discovered he does not want to walk and live in a city without foundation. Why? Egypt is a city without foundation. He was looking for a city with foundation whose architect and builder is God. See, when you see and have this urgency, you are called to denounce. See, you will denounce. You will denounce the things many cherish and chase after. You will denounce the wealth of this world. You will denounce the pleasures of this world. Once you see that God has called us to walk in the kingdom road, 
and he has prepared for us a city. Oh, we should no longer be ashamed of the gospel. Let the intellectuals criticize or condemn us. Say, oh, don't bring in religion here. Don't talk about God here. Who are you to mention God? Tell them, no, let's refuse to let man quiet us. Because it's this, these people they call the well to do in society, the doctor, the advanced intellectuals, scientists, medical science, they have a way to erode the values of God in the system of this world as if God is of no value or is irrelevant. Look at Moses. Moses discovered the immense treasure of seeking Jehovah. Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses chose, he chose to be mistreated with the people of Elohim and to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. Verse 26. He regarded his grace for the sake of Messiah as of greater worth. This does not appear to be intellectually sound. It does not look scientifically accurate. And a man like Moses of his status will regard his grace for the sake of Messiah as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. That Moses desired this grace. He chose this grace. He chose a part of this grace. For the sake of Messiah, as of greater worth than the treasure of Egypt. Because he was looking ahead to his reward. He was looking ahead to his reward. But to the seven, by faith he left Egypt, migration. The fate of the migrant. These men were not afraid to leave the host country. They knew in their heart they had a home. Ah, they knew they had a home. Have we lost a vision of our home? This man Moses left Egypt. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered. Because he saw him who is invisible. He passed away because he saw him who is invisible. Hebrews 11 16 again. Or better still, verse 13. So, verse 13 will help us get. Get more clarity. Hebrews 11, 13 to 16. Hebrews 11, 13 6 to 16. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were see, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. And now look at the foreigners and strangers concept. Now they were admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. You know, we, what weakens our conviction is our attachment to place, ethnic attachment to color, ethnic attachment to race, ethnic attachment to gender, ethnic attachment. We, we attach our sense of being to places and to structures. It becomes where we find our confidence. It could be your wealth. It could be your nationality. It could be your family background. It could be your family name. And you don't want that threatened. 
Because if it, if it's threatened, your whole life will be affected. It could be your job. Those things could be your security. We often grow a sense of false security that once those security factors are threatened, our lives become disastrous. What the patriarch did was not to attach their security to human structures. They attached their security to the kingdom of God. They lived with a deep embrace that they had a home. An actual home. It was indeed not their host country. It was indeed not their host country. So what did these men do in verse, in verse 13? Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. So we need to develop again as we, as we come to a place of repentance of how we live our life. We must embrace the foreigners and strangers concept of life or way of life. If, if we begin to live with this idea, this worldview, this pattern of life, that I am a stranger and a foreigner in this world, our faith in God will be more strengthened, more empowered, and we will become difference makers. To live as a stranger and a foreigner on earth is to retain the vision of our heritage. Is to sustain the awareness of the kingdom of God daily in our life. Is to live with a mission daily. Is to live more courageous and more bold. Is to live with a deep sense of a Jehovah's presence in your life. Would we develop the strangers and the foreigners concept, idea of living our life now? I'm not from here. We we'll live daily knowing we are strangers and foreigners on earth. Where are we migrating to? Where are we moving towards? We are moving towards our homeland. There is something about our homeland, which I will explain now. Verse 14 says, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they have been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. A homeland is, an, is a heavenly one. It means to, that we must embrace the heavenly vision. For us to live our life with this idea of the heavenly homeland, there's something we must avoid. There's something we must address today. And there's something we must repent of or repent from. First Peter 2 verse 11. First Peter 2 11. Hallelujah. First Peter 2 verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exile. Look at this, this, this same idea mentioned in Hebrews 11 verse 15 and 16. Peter is writing now. And see what it says here. First Peter 2 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles or strangers to abstain from sinful desires 
which wage war against your soul. In the course of living our life with a vision of our homeland, why not being inundated and having our minds cultured by the host country, Peter tells us the way out. Dear friends, it begins, I urge you as what? As foreigners and exiles. When God looks down at us, he looks down at people who do not belong where they are. In writing, Peter addressed the saint as foreigners. He's telling foreigners how to live in a foreign land. <laughs> when you live your life so absorbed in this world as your homeland, you've missed, you've missed, you've wasted your life. You will be full of worry. That's why you will be full of worry. You are so full of worry, so full of fear, anxiety, high blood pressure because you are protecting a place, not your homeland. God is calling you and I back home. Home means having a heavenly vision of the kingdom, living with a deep sense of desire for the city with foundation, whose architect and builder is Elohim. Whatever man, man give, man can take. You can lose all you have to recession, to inflation, to bankruptcy, to flood, to an earthquake. Because why? The earth, the world is a city without foundation, but if we sow and lay up treasure in heaven where neither moth or rot or thief can steal, the Bible enjoys us to live with a deep sense of, of the homeland vision. A separate people, a set apart people. Walking on this earth as strangers and foreigners. There's only one thing we are told as foreigners to abstain from. And this is one thing you and I will, have, will, will, will face. The battle. It's a battle of sinful desires. What about called fleshy word? Lost. First Peter 2 11 tells us again as foreigners and exiles to abstain. Abstain means to stay off, stay off, stay off, abstain from fleshy loss. Abstain, abstain, stay off sinful desires. What are fleshy lusts? And how is how are fleshy loss dangerous to a pilgrim or a foreigner? Why must we abstain from self from some sinful laws? It tells us that they wage war against our soul. Fleshy laws wage war against your soul. The soul is made up of three components: the will, the intellect, and the emotion. The will, your will, your intellect, and your emotion. The devil will attack a pilgrim. The devil will attack a stranger. The devil will attack you as a foreigner in this world with fleshy, sinful desires. They appeals to make you like one of them. He knows you don't belong in the system. But he's going to present to you sinful desires to appease you, to seduce you. The devil fights the believer through seduction. Many of us, our worries are nothing but seduction. Your anxiety as a result of the seduction you are falling to the you are falling to by the enemy. 
You're falling a victim to the seductions of the enemy. Sinful desires are seductions. They are counterfeit pleasure. The enemy presents to us false and contrary satisfaction to distract us and to make us like one of his natives. A sinner is a native to the land of sin. A sinner or the, the people of the world, the sinners are native. Sin is a native language to them. Sin is, sin is to them what the water is to the fish. But to you who is a foreigner and a stranger, the devil knows you are not, you are not part of his natives. What it does is that he attacks you with sinful desire, sinful pleasure, fleshy pleasure. This fleshy pleasure are temptations. And that's one thing the word temptation comes, temptation. He tempts us with fleshy desires. He tempts us with fleshy loss to entangle us with the world. The way the enemy entangles a pilgrim, a stranger, a foreigner with the system, he, says, he uses seduction to entangle us with the system. Many of us have been seduced. He can, he can seduce you so long and so much that you forget the homeland. You begin to live with a deep sense and a loss of awareness of the kingdom of God. When your worries, your fear, your anxiety controls your life, you've lost the vision of the homeland. If all your target, all your ambition is in what your life will look like in the face of people, if all your desire is human applaud, human appraiser, human recognition, if your pursuit is for human recognition, you've lost the vision of the homeland. Moses was convinced of the homeland vision, he left Egypt. Abraham, once convinced of the homeland vision, left his native land. This patriarch embraced the homeland vision. They were seeking and longing for a city with foundation whose architect, designer, and constructor is Elohim. I want that life. People who still find pleasure in sin, who still find pleasure in sin, in morality, in lust, are people who have not understood the power of the homeland. When you know where you are from, when you see the beauty, the pleasure, the glory of the homeland, you will resist sin. You will. You will grow in faith, in boldness, in courage. You will break off the entanglement of the world off you. We must begin to live as people who are in the world but not of the world. We are in the world but not of the world. To regain a deep place in our heart of living our lives again as pilgrims, as Aliens are strangers in this world. You know, we live with a vision. Sometimes we can have a we, we can have a false understanding. Change, change your world. Change. You know, we have visions like you can change your world. But you can't. You can't change your world. And when people say you can change your world, they have a sense of, they have a sense of, you know, making a difference in the world. But the difference we are called to make in the world is to live as people not a part of it. The only way we can make a difference in the world is to live 
as if we are not part of it. You can't make the difference in the world by living as if you are part of, of it. If all believers begin to live as if we are not part of it, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, they are their they are teachings like the dominion, the dominion theology, which tells us to occupy till I come. You know, God wants us to dominate the world. He wants us to conquer the world. You know, we have teachings like these that makes the the believer begin to think of the world as their homeland. Believers in politics, believers in business. So we as believers are told to go into the world and then make a difference in the world. But no, saint, we can't make a difference in the world until we regain a deep sense of our difference from the world. You must understand your difference from the world. It is the understanding of our difference. Once we understand our difference, Abraham knew his difference. Joseph in Egypt knew his difference. He told them, when I die, make sure my bones is not, you don't bury me in Egypt. How come Joseph thought that way? How come Joseph thought that way? Think of how this young man thought. When they were leaving Egypt, they took Joseph's bone along. Because Egypt is not his homeland, so his bones should not be there. Down there, in Babylon, they knew who they were. They knew their difference from Babylon. They knew deeply within themselves that they were strangers and exiles. As strangers and exiles here in this world, Peter tells us to abstain from sinful desires. Sinful desires. Sinful desires are seductions. They are the enticement of the enemy, just like the enemy enticed Eve with the fruits. The enemy enticed us with sinful desires and they come through temptation. And many times when this temptation comes to you, you would think they are from within you. But the enemy is behind, is around you, bringing a suggestion. Temptations do not come as temptations of the enemy does not come with a loud voice from Satan. Oh, I'm tempting you. No. The devil brings us brings temptation to us through sinful desires. He will seduce you. The devil will seduce you. To pull you out of the will of God. The goal of sinful desires is to war against your soul. The goal of sinful desires is to war against your soul, not your spirit, man. Why? In Messiah, you are a new creation. But the devil uses sinful desires to war, to war against your soul. The sinful desires war against your emotion. Your emotion first. Your emotion is a ground is a is a level playing ground for this attack of sed, of seduction. Your emotion and seduction. Your emotion will fight the battle of seduction. Seduce to pull out of the will of God. Then he attacks your intellect. Through what the Bible calls strongholds, argument, pretension, ungodly mindset. 
then he attacks your will. He goes from the emotion, your intellect, then he attacks your will. Before long, you as a believer, who is supposed to be the light, live your life as if you are darkness. This is where many believers find themselves. The devil wages war against their soul using sinful and fleshy desires. You can't overcome these things until you know how. The way out of overcoming sinful desires is to abstain. Abstain means to stay off. They will come, they will come at your direction, but you must stay off. Stay away. Stay off sinful desires. When they come, just know this is a temptation of the enemy to seduce me. I refuse to attend to them. I stay off, living my life as a stranger. When sinful pleasures come to distract me from the mission, I stay off. I abstain from sinful desires, fleshy desires. Once you allow them to get into you, they will wage war against your soul. And many believers are not winning this war. Many believers are not winning the war against their soul. Many believers have their souls corrupted by sinful desires. Fleshy desires crush the souls of many believers. Fleshy pleasures. The pleasures of the host nation drains your energy from focusing on the homeland. What the patriarch show us is that we can abstain from sinful pleasures. If we strengthen our focus daily on the homeland, we must daily strengthen our vision Every day as we wake up, knowing today I will live my life as a stranger and as a pilgrim in this world. I will set my emotions not on ethnic things, but on things above. The more we do this, the more we are free. The more the weight of, the weight of destruction is broken off our shoulders, the more we are centered on Jehovah's kingdom, the more we become vocal, the world will look at us and they will see the difference. We don't involve ourselves in their entertainment. We don't involve ourselves in their business. We live as set apart worlds to live this way is the way we make a difference in the world. So I'm free. I'm free deep in my heart. I'm free. I refuse the worries, the baggage of worries and fear and anxiety. I refuse to struggle to hold on to that which will crumble. Let our heart be free again. To trust in Jehovah. To trust again in Jehovah. This gets the attention of God. So in conclusion, let's look again to Hebrews 11. Let's turn again to Hebrews 11. In conclusion, let's turn again to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 verse 16. As we pray... That your vow will help us change the way we live our life. Hebrews eleven sixteen. Instead, instead, they were longing for a better country. Hallelujah. I'm longing for a better country. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Hallelujah. A heavenly one. Are you longing for a heavenly country? As I see the murder, the injustice, the poverty, the corruption, the wickedness, the lawlessness, daily, I'm longing for a better country. 
When you look around our society, there must grow in us a longing for a better country. Not this country we see. I must not allow this current country, which is our host country, confuse our mind and blind us from the heavenly vision. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, Elohim is not ashamed to be called their God. Could it be that God is ashamed to call himself a God? Could it mean there are requirement, there is something we must do if he will not be ashamed of us? The people that he is not ashamed to call their God are people like, like Joseph and Daniel. Men who live with a longing for a better country. Men who live with a, with a vision that the heavenly city was their home city. These are the men that God is not ashamed to be called their God. A believer who is warped and absorbed in self, in his greed, in his self-centered, in selfish and sinful desires, God is ashamed to call such a believer his God. He calls himself the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob. Why? Could it be this man and that attachment that God could call, them, call himself their God because Abraham Isaac and Jacob lived with a longing for the heavenly city. Could it be that when we not live our lives with a vision of a city with foundation, living each day in dependence on Jehovah, living free from the downward, the downward pool of self, the downward pool of sin, the downward pool of our convenience, the downward pool of self-gratification, the downward pool of sinful pleasures. Could it be that when we free ourselves from this pool downward, God himself becomes attached more to us to such a degree that he is no longer ashamed to be called our Elohim. For such, we are told, he has prepared a city for them. God is preparing a city. This city is not for the weak. It is not for the liar. It is not for the unbelieving. It is not for the fearful. It is those who will embrace the heavenly vision. If your heart is too engrossed in this world, the city of God is not for you. God has prepared a city for them. A city for them. Father, we thank you today. We appreciate your word and we thank you for the entrance of your word gives light. We come in repentance today. Repentance means an about face turn to change the way we live our lives. We, we've lived a worldly life. We claim to be believers, but yet we live worldly. Everything is sure we live worldly. We may read our Bible and pray, but we still live worldly. We can trace and track our life and see worldliness. We can see seduction all around the way we live our life. But today you offer to us deliverance that we are called to live as pilgrims and strangers in this world. That we are called to seek the heavenly city, the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is Elohim. That men who live like this, you are not ashamed to be called their Elohim. I want you not to be ashamed of me. Today, let my heart be free from attachment to material things, attachment to self, Attachment to human praise, attachment to human appraisal, and attachment to human recognition, attachment to human applause. My heart is set free from the fear of men, human approval, 
I declare today that in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, I live with a heavenly vision. Purge our heart today from the fear that holds us back. The fear of lack. The fear of human rejection. The fear of human ridicule. Moses was not ashamed to leave Egypt when he caught the vision of the heavenly city. Oh, praying for courage today and boldness. We denounce sin. We denounce self. And we ask that today we will live with a heavenly vision. We will live with the immigrant faith, the faith of the migrants. We will not set for ourselves empires in this world. We will not build empires in this world. We won't build up for ourselves mansions in this world. We we'll build tents. We we'll live in a tent concept, knowing we have a heavenly city, knowing we are journeying back home, the place you have prepared for us. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua's mighty name, we pray. Hallelujah. 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 I'm sure you're blessed today. I pray this message. I pray this message will re-echo your heart day by day. I pray this message will re-echo your heart day by day. Take that stuff off my please. I pray this message will re-echo your heart day by day. And may you walk in the light of this understanding. In Yeshua's mind, and I will pray. Saints, I want to encourage us to share this broadcast. If you're watching and you've been blessed, let's share this broadcast so many more people can be awakened to walk with a vision of the heavenly city. With the vision of the heavenly city in Yeshua's name. So let's let's take an offering right now. Let's take an offering. Let's give Yehovah an offering today. Yehovah said we should not come to his presence, his presence empty-handed. And for those who are watching us live also, you could also be a part by giving an offering to Yehovah through House of Israel. Your offering is a connection of your faithfulness. Your offering is a statement, a verbal statement of your love. Through your offering, you're partnering with Yehovah to do great things on the earth. And if you're with us live online, you could give your offering to PayPal or right on to our website. And I pray that Yehovah bless and receive every offering we give today in honor of his holy name, Yeshua's name. But I will declare every offering and every seed blessed today. Receive the sacrifices of praise. I will decree that today nothing will be too big to give to you. We give our lives to you completely, Yehovah. We live with a stranger mentality. Thank you, Father. Thanks for being a part of this broadcast today. Shalom, saints.